I think we'll start with a simple question, and uh, the question is turned towards uh, Elvis, behind the camera. Uh, on this shape, how many sides do you see? Zero. Zero? Yes. Okay. Uh, and how many edges do you see? Two edges. Two edges. And zero sides? You don't see two sides? You don't see, no, I mean... No, 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 no. Sides. Sides, like inside and outside? Inside, outside. Two sides, okay. Now, uh, I, I, asked, uh, I asked Elvis, and not you, because you know too much. I'm not innocent. Yeah. You're not innocent. Uh, this is a Tabat Möbius, in Hebrew it's called Tabat Möbius, and Möbius in English it's called uh, Möbius or Möbius strip, sure. created by August Ferdinand Möbius, a mathematician of the, of the 19th century, he was born in the 18th, and he tries to... Um, to show all kinds of things, but we are not delving into this. I simply wanted to show this shape, which seemingly has two sides and seemingly has two edges, but actually, if you follow my finger, you'll see that, that it has only one side here. See where it goes out, comes in and goes out, and then it comes <laughs> in again. It has no inside and no outside. And has no, and it has only one edge, because this upper edge, at a certain stage, becomes the nether edge, and the nether edge ultimately gets to be the upper edge. This is the intro to a, to a discussion on are simulations as real as real reality. And is reality a simulation? I thought I would do this because it's hard to find your, uh, as we say in Hebrew, to find our legs and our hands with, the, with this terminology. What is real and what is really real and what is, uh, and if a simulation is good, then it, is, it probably simulates reality. Yes, this is exactly what David Chalmers says. David Chalmers is a philosopher of consciousness probably the leading philosopher of consciousness. Of today? Of today. And Chalmers says, what is this uh, conversation? Why are we having this conversation? So the, uh, simulation is as real as reality. Simulation is another reality. It's, it's a form of reality. So why are we making this artificial distinction? Simulation, for instance, uh, yeah. Richard III? Uh, All simulations, he said, are real. Otherwise, they would not have, we would not have access to them and they would have no effect on us. Okay. They are as real as this yes. room, as Elvis, we, as you we, and me. We cry in movies and we laugh. Yeah, and simulations are real. And if we, if we create a simulation on a computer and we enter this simulation with our minds, for example, there is something called Second Life, which is a simulation of first life, of real life, and people play this simulation. Now we have the metaverse coming, which we will discuss separately, where people will wear certain gear, certain devices, which will deceive them into thinking that they are inside the computer, etc., etc. So, so, so why, why we waste time on this totally artificial and meaningless distinction between reality and simulation? He said, reality, uh, simulation is reality, and he said even more, if you take into account that intelligence Intelligent creatures like to simulate. They love to simulate. They simulate all the time. And we, we realize that the universe is flooded with intelligent creatures, all of them simulating. He said it's very likely that what we call reality, this room and Elvis and the cameras and so on, is someone's simulation. He said he thinks there's a teenage, teenage alien who is simulating Playing us. Playing yes. Simulating us, uh -huh. we are simulation. Uh -huh. He said statistically, and this is right, statistically we are far more likely to be a simul someone's simulation than to be a reality. Or like the figment of one's dream. Yes. Of course this leads immediately to God, you know, God as the simulator. God as the simulator Descartes. and the world as, his, as, uh, as no. his or her dream. Dream, Descartes, uh, Descartes evil, dem evil demon. Um, the Japanese story about are you dreaming that you're a butterfly or are you a butterfly dreaming that you're you, etc, etc. All these, all these, so it's nothing new. This, this strand, strand of thinking is nothing new. It permeates Eastern and Western thinking for, for millennia. 
we have difficulty to tell apart, for example, dream states from reality. When we are in a dream state, oh, yes. we, we believe we're there. We, yes. it's, it's real, real to you. It, it can even have a physiological effect. You can die in a dream if it's, you know, very... I can turn off dreams. Can yeah. you? Well, I can't, but there is something called lucid dreaming, which is control of the contents of your dreams and when you start and finish them. When a dream becomes too... Uh, uh, too... Terrifying. Um, menacing, I simply, I say, I don't want this dream. <laughs> I, I, I probably know that it's a dream mm. by then. And I say, no, I don't want this dream and I turn it off. That's a blessing. Yes, it is. And you know very well that most people cannot do that. So most people... I didn't are, know that. Most people are immersed in the dream and they believe it's, I, a, it's reality. I live in myself. Yeah, well, you see, <laughs> that ties, ties into another conversation. I, uh, it might come as a surprise, not, I don't fully agree with Chalmers on, on several, several grounds. First of all, I think we should distinguish between uh, reality and simulations because simulations require a trigger. Reality doesn't. When you're born into reality as a baby, you don't have to do anything no. to be in reality. Reality is. Immediately accessible to you. Reality is. is exactly. In, in, this, in, in this être, in this isness, <laughs> it is immediately accessible to you. You don't have to, to adopt you don't have to wear any equipment, you don't have to make any decision, you don't have to exercise your will. Because let's, let's go with Chalmers. Let's go with Chalmers. So, but before we go with Chalmers, what I'm saying actually is that we do have a preferred state. It's not true that all our experiences are of equal status, mm -hmm. which is what Chalmers is saying. Chalmers is saying it doesn't matter if you're in reality. Your experience is, there's no privileged experience. All your experiences are equal status. I vehemently disagree with this. I don't think it's true. Because simulation requires an act of will of some kind. Some kind. Yes. So even to... Sus if suspending disbelief, it's called. Suspending in, disbelief, in act of will. Um, act of will means to do something. Even if, if, even if in the future all you will have to do is say, simulation please. Yes, and it, and it turns and out. Then it turns, but still... You'll have there will to be this sesame. Yes, there will be the sesame open thing. There's yeah. always. So I do think there's a state of things. A state. I will not call it reality. There's a state of things to which we have immediate access, unmediated, unmediated by anything, not by technology, not by anything. And this makes it privileged. And we compare actually all simulations to this privileged state. That's why we call them simulations. And this is why we call a piece of art which simulates reality well, that it has very similitude. Yes. That it has, yeah. that its simulation yeah. is veri veritable. Is veritable. Or the concepts of simulacrum, etc., etc. It all, it all contains, contains the hidden assumption that there is a privileged frame of reference to which you are comparing things. That's my first disagreement with him. Second disagreement. Let's take, let's go with Chalmers. Let's go where he's leading. I say, okay, in the future, we will embed computers in the brain. We will not have them. They will not be external. It will just be a tiny chip. The moment you're born, they will inject it through your ear or through your nose into your brain. It will embed itself in your brain. And as your brain evolves, it will tap. It will access this chip. That's already in the works. Really? Yes, people are already thinking about it. So, what is the benefit of it? Well, you will have all the Encyclopedia Britannica at your disposal, oh. you will have uh, internet in okay, your head, yes. and most importantly, you will be able to simulate. You will, you will have access to simulations. You will know, you'll know how to speak uh, Tagalog yes. and, and French. Uh, all languages, absolutely. And uh, yes. Inuit. Everything will be on the chip. And you will not, in other words, this will eliminate learning essentially, uh -huh. an education. Okay, let's assume we have a chip like this in the brain. So Chalmers, had you been Chalmers, Chalmers could have told me, we, we have a privileged frame of reference because the simulations are still external to our brains. But when we bring the simulation into our brains via this chip, we will not be able to tell the difference between a privileged frame and our internal frames. We will just wake up in the morning and we will find ourselves in some environment 
and we will not be able to tell if this environment comes from emanates from inside our minds through the chip or is outside our mind. We will not be able to tell this difference. So that's a very strong argument. But um, still, still I think he's wrong. Had he made this argument, I still think he, he would be wrong. Even if the simulation is embedded in the, in the brain, I don't believe we will ever invent a technology that blurs the lines to this extent. I believe even the most advanced technology ever, like 10,000 years from now, 100,000 years from now, wow. will require You're us, going far. Yes, will will require, require. because it's a principle. Yes, well. Will require a conscious act of will to switch between, between states. I don't believe anyone will create a chip that denies you the power to switch. You, you, you think nobody will want to create a chip? Yes, I think. To, to create a golem that would. Uh, yes, because if I embed, <coughs> if I embed in your mind. The, uh, its yeah. maker? Yes, if I embed in your mind a chip that takes over. And then you wake up in the morning and you don't know if it's the chip which is in control or you are in control. Because if you are in control, you're in reality. You're in the privileged state. If the chip is in control, the chip creates a simulation. And you are in the, in the chips. But you control. know, all these people with intentions like the one who created Frankenstein and, and the golem, uh, they, they, they are sick minds. They, they want to create. They are, of they, course. They may want to clone uh, soldiers to, to, of course. to conquer hills and, and, and bastions. Of course. But that's why, that's why at least two Chinese scientists are in prison. That's why, that's why laws and regulations are for. Uh -huh. I don't, of course, are you ask, if you are asking, is it technically possible? Of course it is. It is. Uh -huh. Of course it is. Is it likely? We shouldn't. I don't we think. Shouldn't let Not it. only we shouldn't. I don't believe it will ever be done. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So okay. So why? I'm glad. So why discuss? Why discuss something the likelihood of which is infinite, uh, vanishingly low? Okay. I mean, we can discuss many, many such things, but philosophy should be grounded in in what is actual, not in you know. So in fantasies. Even there, I disagree with him. I think yes. I think we will have chips in our minds, and I do think we will be able at will to switch from reality to a simulation. For example, I believe there will be a chip that will allow you to have sex. So you, instead of having, when you're in reality, you wake up in the morning, you're horny, you switch on the chip and you have a simulation of sex with a gorgeous girl. But okay. willingly. Willingly. And knowingly. And knowingly. It will be a conscious act of will. Volition will never disappear. From, and the minute there is volition, there's something that tells you the difference between a privilege frame and a simulation. And this is, this is what Chalmers is missing in all his discourse, the volition, the consciousness. He, he, he takes us, he considers human beings as totally passive objects that find themselves in a simulation. Mm -hmm. But human beings don't find themselves no, in a simulation. No, no. Human beings decide to be in a simulation. You know? I, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of, take, uh, of being like uh, 50 years uh, younger and taking out a young girl to see a movie and holding hands, possibly, and seeing the movie, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, mix the movie with what happens For example, in the hall. And if the movie took place in your head, because you have an embedded chip, you would tell the girl you're with, do you mind if we both switch our chips on? <laughs> yes. And we to go see into this the movie? This movie? We, become, we become statists in the movie, you know, observers inside the movie. Yeah. And she would say, yeah, it's a great yes. idea, let's switch, it. let's switch it on. I don't believe there will be a, sta a situation where we will both be sitting in a movie theater and the chip will take over and just fling you into the movie, despite your will. Even if there will be an evil genius who will design such a chip and the chip does take over and the chip does confuse you and does create a simulation, it will definitely be despite your will. So even on the negative side, if you are being kidnapped by the chip, right. it's kidnapping, it's despite your will. The will is there. So this is what rules and regulations are for. So that's where Charles is wrong in my view. He forgets the will. Uh, and another, yes, another issue that is wrong, but we can... Just before it. we go on, uh, how do you spell his name? It's Chalmers. C-H-A-L-M-E-R-S. Okay. 
Okay, for the viewers to look him up. Yeah, David Chalmers. This is his first mistake, I think. The first mistake is to, to say, well, we have reality, we have simulations, and people will switch seamlessly between them. No, they will not switch seamlessly. There will be an interface where they will have to make a conscious choice and a decision of some okay, kind. Okay, that's okay. cogent. That's one. Second mistake I think he makes. He says, even, our real, even what we call reality, this privileged frame of reference, is a simulation. It's a sim someone's simulation, an alien teenager. And he says, well... Does he say, say this, uh, does he me really mean it, or is it just a no, joke? No, he says, and he's right, by the way, I agree with that. He says, statistically, what we call reality is someone's simulation. I happen to agree with him, on statistical grounds. I think what we call reality is, there's an extremely high likelihood that it is someone's simulation. But, here's, here's a mistake. Here's his, his mistake in my view. These are two separate issues. Our reality may be a simulation, but he is talking about simulations within this reality. Okay. In other words, reality is an inescapable frame of reference. You can't escape reality. Whatever you create, if I create a simulation right now and deceive you into thinking that it's reality, it would still be a simulation within reality. We can't escape reality. It's our only frame of reference. Now, it, it's possible that our frame of reference is a simulation, but then this being, this alien teenager who is simulating Benny Handel and Sam Vaknin and Elvis, this teenager, is also embedded in her frame of reference. And her simulation of us is in her reality, mm -hmm. which could be someone else's simulation. But this is a supposition anyway. It's anyhow untestable and unfalsifiable. But the, the philosophical mistake that he is making, the fact that our reality is simulation, doesn't mean that it's not a privileged frame of reference. Okay. The fact that our re reality may be a simulation, does it mean it's not the only framework we have? Right. The only framework we cannot exit the simulation no. anyhow. We, so we can exit by by having yeah. booze or by drink by drinking by by drugs. No, you are drinking and having drugs inside. Inside, there's no way to escape. In your mind, you're in delirium, say. Yes, but but this delirium is embedded in reality. There's yes. no you you even in your delirium, you don't assume that you are exiting reality. You are creating simulations which somehow borrow elements from your reality. These elements are, of course, uh, combined wrongly, or, but they're still elements of reality. There's no way to exit reality. Mm -hmm. It's nonsensical even to say this. The sentence exiting reality is nonsensical. Reality is everything. End of story. Even your simulations are part of reality. It's the privileged frame of reference. And it's immaterial and irrelevant if this reality is real, or a teenager simulation. Or an older person's simulation. Or an older person's simulation. It's immaterial. It's a totally I irrelevant question. Because whether it's real, whether it's simulation which is also real, I cannot exit it. I don't have an observe. So what Chalmers is doing is committing the classical, classical, he is adopting the classical stance of observer and observed system. It's as if we can stand aside from reality and look and say, okay, this is reality and this is simulation, which is indistinguishable from reality. It's as though we can't observe from outside reality. Even our physical experiments are an integral part of reality. There's no way for us to exit reality and observe it. <laughs> so it's... Um, to be able to say that simulation is the same as reality... You need to observe them from outside. He, he has to have a meta-reality. Yes, uh, exactly. reality. He, has, he needs to have a vantage he, point. He needs a, an Archimedean uh, point. He needs a vantage point where he can see both the simulation and reality. Where he can see both of them. And then he can say, yes, they are the same. Okay. But then he needs to be outside both of them. How can he say they are the same if he is not outside both of them?
Is there anything else that you hold and against the shocking, him? The shocking thing for me is that I'm an admirer of David Chalmers. I truly admire his work. But these are rookie, novice mistakes. These are mistakes I would have expected from first-year philosophy students. And you rest your case? I rest my case and I'm disappointed. 